Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar of the new year here at the VSBA. It is entitled Education and the 2020 Legislative Session. And with you today uh, are Sue Siglowski, that's me, Executive Director of the VSBA, and Sandra Cameron, Director of Public Policy at the VSBA. This is our agenda. We are going to have an overview of the legislative process and the 2020 political environment. And then we're going to review some of the VSBA resolutions that affect uh, legislation and ways that school boards can act as advocates in 2020. So first, an overview of the legislative process. This will be brief because some of you probably already know this information, but we like to include it uh, because it is important to understand. The House has 150 representatives and the Senate has 30 senators. They serve two year terms and they convene in January each year for a biennial term, which typically ends in May. And right now we are in the second half of a biennium, which started in the, the second half started this January. It's important to know that the staff at the State House uh, is limited to Legislative Council and the Joint Fiscal Office. And so the committees uh, that are dealing with education related issues will often rely on testimony from associations such as ours to develop all of the uh, considerations that they need to take into account to make policy decisions. Some of the committees of interest, as far as education bills go, are of course the education committees. Also the agriculture committee often will be looking at things like um, school meals or farm to school, uh, the appropriations and finance committees and ways and means, institutions, government operations. Gov government operations looks at things like the open meeting law, the public records law. Um, and health and welfare. At the beginning of uh, this process in January, the governor shares his priorities in the state of the state and um, the budget address. And legislators, meanwhile, are submitting bills for consideration by the committees of jurisdiction. The committees, once they're assigned a bill, they're considering those bills and they're also developing their own bills, committee bills. Once the House or the Senate passes a bill, then it is sent over to the other body for consideration. If House and Senate versions of legislation differ, that's a situation where a committee of conference is developed and both sides um, negotiate a final version of the bill. And the conference committee has three members from each body on it. Once the same version of a bill is approved by both bodies, then it will go to the governor. And if the governor signs the bill, it becomes law. It's also possible for a bill to become a law without the governor's signature. The third possibility is that the governor may veto the bill and it takes the general assembly, um, they can override the veto with a two third majority, which is 100 votes in the house and 20 in the Senate. So now we're going to talk about uh, an overview of the 2020 political environment. A couple of things to note uh, that the Democrats in the General Assembly hold a veto proof majority. That doesn't mean they're always going to be able to override a veto, but it is an important consideration. The impact of the arbitrator's decision in statewide bargaining on budgets is still uh, to be determined. There are, as always a multitude of special interests proposing legislation that affects education. We're seeing a lot of education uh, related bills and the waiting study, its implications and implementation are under consideration. We also like to update you in this webinar on the December 1 tax commissioner's letter. That letter this year predict that predicted that average homestead tax rates and the non-residential rates will increase by six cents that is based on the assumption that there will be 5.53 percent growth in education spending statewide and uh, that letter also states that if budget growth could be restrained, 
restrained to 1.4% cumulatively, which is 1.9% on a per pupil basis, average statewide rates could stay the same as the current year. Even if um, budget growth was restrained to 1.4%, average tax bills would still increase 2.16%, and that is because of rising property values and incomes. So we've got a schematic here showing some of the most um, dominant issues that are coming out impacting education in bills this session. That includes school construction, the role of the state board, there's some labor relations bills, universal after school program, um, the House Ed Committee is, is delving into literacy, uh, Act 166 revisions, which is pre-K, Act 173 implementation considerations, the waiting study, and I think I started at the top with school construction. And many of these things, as you can see with all these uh, interlapping circles, they influence and um, influence each other and are related to each other in some way. And we're going to go into more um, detail about each one of these as uh, we progress through this presentation. So we'll move on to going into the particular issues that are affecting, impacting education in 2020, policy issues. And uh, we did have a question emailed to us early on about school construction. It, uh, the question was, regarding the moratorium on school construction aid, I am concerned about how this will impact the Ed Fund and more importantly, our local budgets. And without the school construction aid, I'm concerned about how building or renovations in other communities, at this point, the large construction bond in South Burlington, will impact our local budgets due to the effect it has on the yield in the state funding formula. So that is definitely a concern. Uh, and I that, that uh, relationship between school construction bonds that are, are passed in communities in Vermont um, and the effect that has on other local budgets because of the statewide system that we have uh, is being communicated to the committees that are looking at this issue. I, I have been in House Ways and Means where they have discussed this topic. So it's definitely something that legislators are aware of and um, it seems like there is much more of an interest this year in actually uh, addressing that issue. Both the House Education Committee and the House Institutions Committee have expressed an interest in considering legislation that would reinstate school construction aid, which was suspended under a legislatively imposed moratorium in 2007. The uh, last year, H209 was introduced that bill has not moved and it's currently in the House Education Committee. Last year, the House Ed Committee and the House Institutions Committee discussed provisions for inclusions in the miscellaneous education bill that would have started the process for examining what actions the state might take with respect to restoration of school construction aid. They talked about sources of funding, assessment of the magnitude and nature of the need, consideration of program criteria for project prioritization. Those were some of the topics that they um, were looking at. Those provisions ultimately were not acted on, but there has been some recent media attention to the issue. There was a piece on BPR recently and also in the St. Albans Messenger uh, editorial and also uh, in combination with the interest of the two committees that I just mentioned, that has the committee chairs working to schedule testimony that's going to be useful, hopefully, in informing considerations on potential legislation. But it does still remain to be seen what action the General Assembly might be taking on this important matter this session. But it's certainly something that's um, high on our priority list. There's, there are also, moving down the slide, there are also um, some labor bills that have been introduced in committees that we wanted to make you aware of. S-226 is an act relating to statewide public school employees' health benefits, and the Senate Education Committee has been taking testimony on this bill. And the 
the, the version that they started out proposed to allow the Commission on Public School Employee Health Event benefits to allocate premium and out-of-pocket responsibilities between employers and employees based on the ability of the employee to pay those expenses. It also was looking at permitting the arbitrator to resolve a dispute uh, for the commission, giving them greater latitude in fashioning a resolution and um, establishing a process for the commission to request and receive information necessary for the negotiations. There's been um, some testimony on that, and that bill is under revision right now, but it, we wanted to draw that uh, to your attention. If you um, go to the VSBA website, you can see the testimony that's been provided by VSBA um, and the request that VSBA has made um, for changes to that bill. The second bill I wanted to let you know about was um, H205, sorry, I'm sorry, H805, uh, an act relating to collective bargaining rights of teachers. The House Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs received an introduction to this bill. And what the bill proposes is that a teacher shall have the right while under contract to be inter to interview for, be offered, and accept a new teaching position for the next school year and interference with the right shall be caused for a licensing action. And that is the bill that we are um, following and maybe offering testimony about um, in the future. The last one that I wanted to draw your attention to is S254. That's a much um, broader bill related to union organizing. The Senate Committee on Economic Development, Housing and Military Affairs has already heard some testimony on this bill and it requires public employers to provide employee contact information in relation to an effort to organize a collective bargaining unit. And there's also a provision in there that um, automatic deduction of public employee union dues um, would be from their paychecks. There are a couple of questions that we got by email um, that I wanted to cover before I move on to the next slide. One of them was, titled Taxation Without Representation. Since our towns are no longer able to negotiate health care costs because the state decided to take over this duty, will the state then take on paying for health care costs as well? Right now, our town's education budget is up 8%. We do our best to keep costs down, but we cannot arbitrarily include costs that we have not planned. Um, the way to look at this question, I think, is um, that school employees are not state employees. So we, we do have sort of a, a hybrid situation as far as the negotiations go, but the negotiators were school board members and they uh, are called the, the employer commissioners. You may have um, received some communications on behalf of the employer commissioners through the VSBA. Um, and so the, the decision of the arbitrator is required to be um, incorporated into school budgets. This year was the first year that the this process happened and the timeline was definitely problematic for schools um, and school boards because of the issuance of the arbitrator's decision in December did not allow a lot of time for incorporating that into the budgets. Um, and so what we, one of the things that we are proposing is to change the timeline so that it's not so tight. Um, and that, that if you are able to look at the VSBA testimony on, on um, S226, uh, you can see that we're proposing a change in the timeline that should help with this, this issue. Um, the next question was, wouldn't it be more beneficial to have all state workers, including teachers in Vermont, Healthcare Connect. The state would then have a broader base of healthy and cost could be at a minimum. Um, so at this point, state teachers are not state workers um, and I'm not sure what the implications are for including them in Vermont Health Connect. It's, I, I believe that the whole system is being looked at um, and evaluated because it's only been um, 
it's only happened once and everyone's taking a look and trying to make adjustments that will make it a better system. Moving on to the next slide, uh, we have the 2020 policy issues impacting education role of the state board, and this is one that Sandra will be covering. Hello, everyone. The role of the State Board Education is currently being discussed in Senate Education. There's a draft committee bill 20-0777 proposing to transfer various duties and responsibilities from the State Board of Education to the Secretary of Education and the list below details um, what's under consideration at this point in time. This uh, change would permit the State Board to focus more on long-term strategy and high-priority educational issues. So it's, it's a shift in role, but also a slight shift in focus. Um, the committee has heard testimony from Secretary of Education Dan French and the Chair of the State Board of Education, John Carroll. Um, they've been both heavily involved in this process, and we will keep monitoring. Other issues that are impacting education have to do with Act 173 implementation. There's a connection to the waiting study and ensuring professional development. Just to go give you a little background for Act 173, um, you're probably all aware of what it is. It, uh, one part of the Act required the Agency of Education to consider and make various recommendations for changes to the census grant funding model changes or additions to the per pupil weighting factors used to allocate special education funding under that model and any additional methods for consideration. Um, based on that uh, requirement, the AOE contracted with UVM to produce the weighting study report. You can find a link to the weighting study report in our most recent legislative report. You should have received that by email, but it is also on our website. Uh, in order to produce the weighting study, the UVM team took uh, a number of steps. They conducted a nationwide policy scan of other states' special ed funding systems with an in-depth focus on nine states. Secondly, they conducted stakeholder interviews to identify experiences with and perceptions of the current funding system. Third, they conducted a risk and cost analysis and proposed a new set of cost factors and weights for the equalized pupil calculation. Fourth, they considered whether adjustments to the special education census block grant are appropriate and developed design considerations. And fifth, they simulated various scenarios for incorporating new cost factors into Vermont's census grant system and then they pro produced an overall findings and recommendations for future policy. That is a very long document but uh, one of the ways that you can familiarize yourself with it is to read the executive summary. And that is probably only about, it's between five and 10 pages long, I think. On January 8th, the lead author, Professor Tammy Colby from UVM, presented the waiting study to the House Committees on Education and Ways and Means, along with one of the co-authors, uh, Bruce Baker from Rutgers University. And their summary, or the, I'm sorry, their presentation, a summary of findings from the study of pupil weights in Vermont's education funding formula can be uh, found through the legislative report as well. There's a link to it. And on January 16th, Professor Colby testified uh, to the House Ways and Means Committee regarding the impact of the equalized pupil calculation on tax rates. And she also presented the waiting study to the Senate Education Committee. So several committees have been informing themselves about the waiting study. On January 29th, which is the most recent action that's happened uh, in the State House about the waiting study, AOE Secretary Dan French presented a policy recommendation to the House Ways and Means Committee. And you can find his policy recommendation there is a link to it in the latest legislative report. We expect that these committees are going to be continuing to analyze the waiting study and how it may be utilized, especially with respect to its interconnectivity to Act 173. And we'll be keeping you informed about what is happening with the waiting study. There was a question about the waiting study and whether there's been any action at the house, state house on it. So we've told you a little bit about what's happening in committee. The 
the other action that's happening is that um, Representative Laura Sibelia has introduced four bills regarding the waiting study, and um, those can be found on the legislature's website. Act 166 is the universal pre-kindergarten law currently um, already enacted. The House Committee on Education has been discussing possible revisions, and they are currently on draft number three. Um, this, these would make changes to current law that would propose, among other things, eliminating the joint administration by both the Agency of Education and the Agency of Human Services, requiring that school districts pay tuition for pre-K education, um, and when they do so, they must use uniform forms, standard forms and processes, which would be developed by the AOE, and to simplify and clarify the quality criteria for pre-kindergarten providers, specifically the requirement that all students have equitable access to instruction by a licensed teacher. Um, there's been quite a bit of conversation in the House Education Committee with lots of testimony from various different perspectives. So uh, we're currently looking at version 3.1 and we'll continue to be involved in this process. Um, with regard to literacy, uh, the House, again, House Education Committee has been hearing a lot about literacy from various members from the field and in the community. They're focused on literacy. They understand the connection between improving literacy and supporting struggling students, as is called for in Act 173, and they see a need to have a coordinated approach. The committee has um, reviewed recommendations of the DMG report. They've heard testimony from advocates, practitioners, the public. They've um, learned about Secretary of Education Dan French's approach to potential policy recommendations through his testimony. Um, there were four literacy bills proposed um, addressing early literacy screening and early instruction in different ways. However, currently the committee is reviewing a bill that would more closely connect to the DMG report and provide grants. Moving to the second point on this slide, um, universal after-school program. The Senate Education Committee voted out a committee bill which establishes an after-school task force of 15 members. This was one of the governor's um, priorities in his State of the State address, S-335. These members include designees on behalf of Vermont Principals Association, Vermont Superintendents Association, Vermont School Boards Association, and Vermont Council for Special Education Administrators, as well as the Secretary of Education, Secretary of Human Services, the Vermont Council of Independent Schools, Vermont Home Study Programs, and the Vermont Boys and Girls Club, and three other representatives from after-school programs, as well as one senator and one representative. Right now, the bill is simply calling for a task force that would consider and make recommendations on a framework for the cost of and um, the long-term funding sources in order to assure universal access. The current draft um, requires this task force to prefer solutions that do not draw upon the state's education fund and ask that they explore the possibility of using potential revenue from the taxation and regulation of cannabis. The work um, of this task force is to begin on or before June 30th of 2020, and the task force is asked to submit a written report to the governor and the House and Senate Committees on Education on or before December 15th, 2020. The bill um, was voted out of the Senate Education Committee and was referred on to appropriations because of potential costs. So we'll move into VSBA resolutions applicable in 2020. And before we get into the specific resolutions, I'll just um, quickly let you know our resolution process. Any board that is um, in a member SU or SD can submit a proposed resolution to the VSBA. We have, uh, you, you should be in the spring receiving emails of, from uh, VSBA regarding resolutions, inviting your board to submit resolutions. And once those um, submit resolutions are submitted to the VSBA, there's, there's usually a deadline. I believe it was in July last year, but sometimes we um, change the deadline to, to allow for the, uh, the process to work more smoothly. So keep an eye on when that deadline is. And when the deadline is passed. There is a resolutions committee. It includes one VSBA board member from each of our 11 regions and the vice president 
of the VSBA, and they review the resolutions and they make they make recommendations to the um, VSBA board as to whether the the recommendation is to pass, do not pass, or not to take a position on the resolution. Um, but all resolutions that are submitted, whether, whatever that position is, all the resolutions submitted do go to the full membership for vote in um, October or November when we have our annual meeting, the VSBA annual meeting. So the resolutions are are very important because they set the guidelines for the organization's um, legislative platform and response to proposed bills. And I'll go now into some spe specific resolutions that may affect, um, that often do affect um, education related bills. And I would just say here that these are not all of the resolutions that could possibly affect education related bills. And if you would like to see the full list of the SBA resolutions, they are available on our website. So these two resolutions have to do with the role of the school board and the essential work of school boards. In every legislative session, there are bills that propose to add to the duties of school boards. And we, through these resolutions, we work to ensure that proposals are within the proper role of school boards and that they are not unfunded mandates. And we have another resolution further on about unfunded funded mandates. We also have resolutions regarding cost containment. Uh, the first one says VSBA advises the Vermont General Assembly to allow reasonable time for school districts to plan for cost containment legislation and refrain from passing legislation that affects budgets already adopted by school boards or approved by voters. This resolution has to do with the composition of supervisory union boards and asks the General Assembly to examine the laws governing supervisory union board structure and the process for waiving the statutory requirements for SU board structure or composition, taking into account issues of fairness, equity, and funding. This resolution has to do with equity, quality, and cost effectiveness. And we follow a lot, many bills in many committees that um, have potential impacts on students and schools. And this resolution is uh, a way that we take a look at those bills and look at whether they are impacting equity, quality, and cost effectiveness. Um, states that the VSBA supports initiatives that are designed to create greater equity and high quality learning opportunities and to achieve cost effectiveness. This is the resolution that I was referring to that um, relates, uh, can be related to the waiting study. Um, it calls for fiscal equity for all school districts to allow equal educational opportunities for all students. And this is an issue that the waiting study um, addresses. The second resolution on this slide calls for the examination of alternative funding sources that are equitable and sustainable rather than continuing a system that relies predominantly on property tax for revenue. So the second resolution um, is a resolution that relates to ed funding and finance. We have a resolution regarding the use of the education fund. It opposes any diversion of funds raised through the statewide property tax to programs that are not within the jurisdiction of public school districts or supervisory unions. And the unfunded mandates resolution I referred to earlier, that's one that states that all new mandated education requirements or programs should be fully funded. And some of the things that we're seeing now that are being um, proposed in the legislature where this resolution has come into play are universal meals um, and uh, the provision of menstrual products in, at no cost in all um, bathrooms used by females in public schools. There's a bill uh, on that topic. We also have resolutions that uh, call for making local school boards, um, emphasizing local decision making says that local school boards have been given responsibilities to see, oversee public education and to make important decisions necessary to 
provide high quality education in an efficient and effective manner and that there shouldn't be state interference in their decision making abilities. Um, so one of the things that's being addressed right now, um, as Sandra mentioned earlier, um, is literacy. And in that case, um, there is uh, a balance that, that can be made between addressing literacy as a state and um, allowing flexibility for local systems to address issues according to their local needs. Talks about the role of the state in education and um, that the agency of education must be properly staffed um, and that the VSBA believes that the state board should include an active school board member, an administrator, and a teacher, um, and um, that the VSBA desires to be a strong partner with the state board in overseeing Vermont's education system. The last resolution that we wanted to make you aware of, and as I said, there are many more, um, has to do with early education. And the VSBA's resolution on early education encourages the General Assembly to create universal access to pre-kindergarten education. Um, that, that bill, you know, that has been in place, um, but we're still working on a system that emphasizes equity, quality, and simplicity. School districts should play a central role in assuring quality and accountability in publicly funded early education programs. So this resolution has um, already um, come into play this year with the proposed revisions to Act 166. And VSBA's testimony has focused on the words that are underlined in this resolution, equity, quality, and simplicity. So we do rely on our resolutions and that's why we encourage boards to submit them because those are the, um, the official positions of the organization. There are times during the legislative session when there is not a resolution that addresses an issue. And in that case, the VSBA board provides guidance to the staff as to how to um, address any questions on legislation dealing with that topic. Are there any questions on the VSBA resolutions? I do have a couple of questions. Okay. It says, do you think the legislature has a sense of how costly the healthcare arbitrators award will be to school districts? We have conveyed that information to the Senate Education Committee. I don't think that committee has been specifically focused on the cost, but we have been providing information to them about what the employer commissioner's expert in the negotiations um, estimates those costs to be statewide. And uh, that certainly is going to become, I think, more apparent when the full information is available through the Agency of Education um, about school budgets this year and how um, much they have increased. Brad James from the Agency of Education was in the House Ways and Means Committee last week. At that point, 30% of districts had reported to the AOE on their um, budgets. And at that point, point uh, statewide or with for, with those 30 percent um, the increase was 4.2 um, percent and the December 1 letter had been anticipating um, over 5 percent so he, there weren't any alarm bells going off yet um, but it will be interesting to see what the number is um, that is reported by AOE once 100% of the budgets are reported to the AOE. Are there any conversations about better resourcing the AOE to better provide better information and technical help to school districts? Yes, that is a conversation that happened quite frequently during the legislative session last year. I anticipate that it is going to continue this year. The House Education Committee has been 
focusing so far on pre-K and literacy. Um, it may come up within those discussions, but it is an overarching issue um, that I that that legislators are concerned about. So finishing up with our last topic, how can school boards um, act as advocates in 2020? We have a few tips here. It is helpful and important to establish a relationship with your legislators so that you can be a good source of information on education issues that impact your community. And the best way for you to um, quickly get information on how to contact your legislators is through the VSBA's, um, the Education Collaboratives Legislative Report, which is on the VSBA's website. And there is a link right at the beginning of the report. And with that link, you will be able to find out um, which representatives and senators fall within your um, SU or your supervisory district. Your messages to your legislators should emphasize the effect on students, not on you as a board, and present your view to the legislators in, in language that they will understand. We, it, it's always best, um, and I think school board members are good at this, um, to, be very, to be direct and to use simple language and avoid using um, a lot of jargon, um, which I think school board members are, are quite good at um, using, using language that people can understand. Because of the many last minute changes which a bill can undergo, it's important to support positions and principles rather than specific legislation um, because you could be looking at one version of a bill, you know, three days before you um, testify. And by the time you've gotten in there to testify, they're on like an, um, two or three versions later. And it may not be, um, what you say may not be as applicable anymore. So it is important to talk about positions and principles rather than specific legislation. We have some resources to support your advocacy. I've referred several times to the legislative reports from the Vermont Education Legislative Collaborative. That collaborative is made up of different education associations who have pulled together in order to be able to um, provide these written reports to you. The VSBA does send out updates and action alerts when there's something that um, really de deserves your attention right away. Um, we have commentary and testimony on our website, and um, you, you're always um, able to take a look at that and see what the VSBA has provided in terms of testimony. And then lastly, we are very happy to make connections for you with legislators or committees that um, on issues that you are concerned about. So if there is something that you uh, read about in the report or in an update or action alert, and you would like some information about who it would be helpful for you to contact, you should feel free to call our office and speak with me or speak with Sandra, and we are happy to give you that information. I will also mention that at the top of our public policy page, um, you'll find in three different formats, the, the contacts for your local legislators, and they're divided up by supervisory union to make it easier to see who your legislator is. And is the Education Legislative Collaborative information come from the VSBA through email, or is it, or is this another organization? The Education Legislative Collaborative is a group made up of the VSBA, the Vermont Superintendents Association, the Vermont Principals Association, the Vermont Council of Special um, Education Administrators, um, VSBIT, Vermont School Boards Insurance Trust, um, VASBO, the Vermont Association of School Board Officials, that's the business um, managers, and VITCLA, which is the Vermont um, Curriculum Leaders Association. So it is all of those associations joining together to be able to have a legislative analyst um, in the state house during the session and to be able to produce the legislative report that goes out um, 
about every other week. The legislative report does go out to school board members um, who are in an SU or SD that is a member of the Vermont School Boards Association. And um, if you are, if you fall in that category, which you do if you're on this webinar and you're not getting those reports by email, please call our office. The next slide I believe is gonna have some contact information for you with the phone number and uh, let Carrie know that you're not getting your emails from the VSBA and she will be able to remedy that for you so that you will receive the legislative reports. They are also posted on our, on our website, but they may not be posted um, right away. So the best way for you to get the information quickly is to have it emailed to you. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this legislative webinar and encourage you to join us for future webinars. Um, we hope this is a um, convenient time for you and um, that you've learned some useful information that will um, enhance your role as a school board member. Thank you, everyone.